coming to the presentation as such, I, you know, I always believe that dreams are, you know, uh, something which are the blueprint for our aspirations. And as long as we believe in them fiercely and tirelessly, you know, we always witness that magic that transforms actually into reality. And it has happened for me and for my own journey as such. Um, I've been, you know, I, I'm a mother of two, uh, two kids actually, and uh, two handful, obviously. So, you know, and, and I have my own journey of, uh, you know, taking a break as a mother and making sure that, you know, I'm doing justice to my own career and also being part of the system as such to do best in my uh, journey as such. And, uh, you know, to start with, I would say that, yes, um, I, as I So .NET basic, what we see is typical HTML, JS, CSS, the JavaScript, and the web services, you know. Um, so, you know, this is something which we ought to know on the as a .NET basic, and I'm sure you would be able to relate to it. Now, coming to the next level, when we see, you know, there are there has been, uh, you know, the tech evolution where we saw the WCF, the you know Windows Communication Foundation or the Platform Foundation or Workflow Foundation has actually been placed. Um, I, you know, I. I, I don't know how much of you, how many of you are actually also participating and doing, uh, you know, part, uh, participating in the WPF or WCF, that kind of a uh, coding as well. MVC architecture, the model view controller architecture, I'm sure this is the core thing which actually also evolved around the same time where we also look at the .NET MVC, but parallelly the web APIs also came into existence. The SQL Server, uh, you know, now that the NoSQL and Oracle, you know, technology has always been there. We always seen that yes, uh, these are uh, the typical technologies which we have seen that you know the it has contributed to our uh, you know technology uh, and, you know career as such right. And um, I have uh, also been part of the CLR CLR performance uh, profilers which I have used in my early days of career. Um, you know when I was about five six years of my tech experience, I have um, I had uh, attained the Microsoft certification that time and uh, also the Microsoft Architect certification I've done in those days. This was about 20 years back is what I'm saying. And I think .NET used to evolve at that time where, uh, you know, Oracle SQL Server and, you know, but then CLR, uh, CLR Profiler also was not many of the developers used to use the CLR Profiler. But then when I, you know, made a difference to that, I could really see that uh, the kind of coding and the change what I could bring in in terms of the performance of the code itself was actually enormous. Even similarly, SQL Profiler, I'm sure if you have also, um, you know, uh, used it. So these are all troubleshooting and profiling kind of uh, softwares which you, which .NET also provides. And, um, you know, invariably you'll also expect it to know the design patterns. Um, I'm sure your people who have been working on the .NET core or the full stack, you are supposed to know the design patterns as well. So these are the basic things which you are supposed to know. And, uh, you know, as your experience, um, you know, further uh, evolves, you also look at that, you know, now that um, the MVC and web API has been unified under the MVC core stack, Right, so I, I'll not get into the details of each of these technologies. There is ample information available to us. You could actually go through and understand where your, uh, you know, technology, um, you know, experience has been, how you have actually evolved in each of these spaces and where your performance has been. See, it's not about doing just as a development, as a programmer, right? Programming is only one part. How are we really inclined towards day-to-day -to -day functions? Any company, um, you know, puts the job, you know, certain expectations on the job responsibilities we have, um, either from a design aspect or the, you know, overall architecture of the application we are building or be it the, you know, the testing, uh, you know, angle in terms of how are we different, um, you know, doing, you know, making an effort in terms of creating an application, which is, um, you know, good in performance, um, you know, and is able to look at the integration aspects, um, the, you know, the other uh, you know, technical elements, which I will talk about in the next uh, set of slides. But this is something which we have to also see that, yes, it was just .NET MVC to start with earlier. Then the web API is also evolved so much. Then the, uh, you know, the unified MVC core stack 
has come into play and this is where we are seeing that full full stack expectation and more or less every company is actually expecting us to know um, end to end from the front end uh, to back end to the database uh, development right so this is where um, the uh, i'm sure orm framework if you have heard of the orm framework Entity and the ORM framework, framework, as you can see, it is particularly developed to advance the ADO.NET to really, you know, um, the, on the ADO.NET side, side, actually, we have the ORM framework playing there. But when you, as, a, as when you come in as a full stack developer, you are required to understand the front end technologies. As in, you know, you can see that the Angular and React uh, uh, stack is actually picked up very well. And most of the .NET technologies, you know, what I have seen in the market are um, the, you know, the um, company uh, developers are actually more on the Angular front. I think Angular front, um, you know, the salaries are also a bit higher because the demand on the Angular side is more compared to the React JS. So this is also something which you can pick up and uh, see, um, you know, how you're actually able to build on your skills in terms of your, uh, you know, uh, the front end layer, the middle tier, and also the database tier, right? So the multi-tier architecture, how do we really look at it? So I'm sure in the second stage, if you see multi-tier architecture has always been there from the beginning, but then, uh, you know, even, even in the multi-layer architecture, we have seen the evolution happening in terms of how each of these technologies in terms of the libraries, the .NET um, has actually, you know, put across in terms of the different functional aspects, uh, the ETL libraries or, uh, you know, be it the, um, you know, be it the libraries on the ML front, uh, you know, AI with AI and ML technologies evolving. We'll talk about the ML.NET also in the next set of slides where, you know, how the ML.NET actually evolved from the core.NET API or the core.NET, uh, you know, stack as such, right? Then, you know, you'll also have to see the cross-platform engagement. How are you really looking at the, uh, the UI toolkit, which is what we have, and what kind of libraries are we, you know, given? So, you know, time to time, we will have to see how uh, these, uh, you know, the web API framework or the MVC framework or Blazor, if you have come across or been using the Blazor framework as such, Against each of these frameworks, what we have, the, we do get the toolkits or the libraries against, um, you know, each of these functionalities, wherever we are seeing, either, either in the, to operate in the middle tier or the database layer or in the front end layer, right? So apart from that, there is an expectation that, uh, you know, when you get to this level, you also understand what is agile practices. Um, I, can you also perform a role of a scrum practitioner uh, you know, if you're actually um, uh, leading a particular team or, uh, you know, have some techno a good technology understanding across some of these um, the different uh, core technologies, you also are expected to the leader team. And, uh, you know, in that case, you're also expected to understand the Agile and Scrum, you know, practice, you know, as a pra Scrum practitioner and then uh, you know, making make sure that you can educate the teams on that fronts, right? The sprint meetings and all that, whatever we do, the expectation on each of these sprint meets, meetings is that outcome-based approach, what we are doing. And each of these development, uh, why either we are contributing under the front-end side or back-end side or, uh, you know, full-stack development, how are we really engaging the teams and making sure that um, the agile practices are taken into that, that sprint timelines, whatever we are actually uh, considering Ring, you know, like 15 days sprint or 20 days, uh, typically 15 days as we look at, right? So how do we really make sure that we are aligning our teams to these, uh, uh, you know, uh, small, small uh, snippets of code, which gets really, really released in an agile way. Next, uh, we also look at that the cloud technologies is, you know, has evolved. Cloud technologies has always been there, you know, 10, 15 years, but in uh, initial days, it was, you know, uh, it was not so much accepted, accepted widely. But right now, as you can see that the Microsoft Azure um, itself has its own web apps and, uh, you know, certain APIs. Azure API is what you can actually look at to integrate the cloud aspects and the building in the technologies, right? Uh, techno technical elements for each of these uh, platforms. Whether you are building a Windows application or be it a web application, you also look at, uh, you know, each of these um, practices in terms of how 
we can engage on a uh, you know time to time uh, you know uh, as 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 we progress in building our uh, you know technology stack in, yeah so next comes the microservices the docker the ci cd the devops and the kubernetes so microservices as you can see um, you know this has also picked up well so uh, you know in each of these spaces if you see that we are .NET basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or web services. Any employee around two to five years of experience is definitely is expected to have this kind of experience. Next, if I move in, the MVC architecture or the .NET MVC web APIs, um, having a SQL Server understanding and the knowledge on the SQL joins or the SQL as simple as the basic SQL Server, uh, uh, you know, uh, and ADO.NET uh, features. It is important for us to really look at those and how do you really performance, um, you know, your uh, applications look at these um, unit testing or integration testing or be it performance testing or be it, uh, you know, the uh, profilers, whatever you can use in each of these, um, building the code, whatever you have, whether you've been able to be up to the mark and, uh, you know, improve the performance of the overall engagement and on the application. And, and source to uh, you know different sources or integration platforms whichever we are developing between the legacy systems or be it uh, the different uh, you know uh, products which we are actually bringing together how do we really make sure that the data schemas are built and against these data schemas if either we are using the ETL functions um, or be it the web APIs right how do we really make sure that each of these technologies are integrated into um, our day-to-day -day, uh, development activities. So this is the outlook which we expect from a four to 10 years uh, um, experienced person. If you see, you know, the sooner you achieve this kind of, uh, you know, technology and the mindset, mainly the mindset in terms of uh, not just, uh, you know, developing a code, but also looking at the end picture of the business need and uh, understanding our business, the core business need, not about just uh, the understanding the use cases, um, building the use cases and coming up with the design and approach or the development activity and doing the testing, not just about that, but also understanding the business need. In If I do not develop this particular feature of or a particular functionality under a particular feature or a use case doesn't get uh, you know, doesn't work properly. What is the impact it is going to create uh, for the business? And how is it going to impact the bottom line for the business to operate in a certain scenarios, right? For the use cases which we are being developed. So I think this is the mindset which is very, very important uh, when you have reached that certain stage of, you know, um, around the, more than three years of experience, once you have actually gained, you also have to look at this particular mindset of how people have to see yourself in terms of how business, you know, is going to get impacted in a particular feature if there is doesn't go live or a particular feature doesn't happen in the way it's supposed to function. Now, coming to the five and 15 years experience, this is where next level of mind shift comes where you're talking about the different platforms, uh, the orchestration techniques, let us say if you are looking at the integration technologies, the different kind of orchestration techniques you are provided, um, you know, the, um, the core stack as such is there. But apart from that, you also look at um, the, you know, the either, you know, the batch processing uh, functions or be it, uh, you know, the web APIs, which actually gets, you know, gets you to get the data transfers done between the different integrated platforms. How do we make sure that availability, dependability, reliability, and also, uh, you know, getting the data in the specific time timelines, this has become also very important. This actually defines the product, uh, you know, uh, quality uh, as such. So time to market is very, very important and time to reflect on the data on the application is very important. So by this time, you should be very clear on the troubleshooting techniques. You should be very clear on the performance profilers and you should also understand what are the kind of architectural patterns which we have, not only on the design front, but also on the core aspects of different architectural principles which can be brought in in terms of developing certain such applications. Whether it is a platform-based applications, 
or you know be it uh, you know or be it the web web applications right so and um, again most of the companies are moving into the cloud based solutions now cloud based solutions also expose a certain set of challenges in terms of standardization uh, you know standardization certain apis which have work happen to work in amazon may or may not work in azure and how is the compatibility which we are actually building? So today's application, let us say tomorrow it gets hosted into a different cloud uh, solution or different cloud solution, you know, uh, tech, uh, platform. How do we ensure that these cross-platform, uh, you know, application uh, scenarios are also being addressed? So as in when you are actually developing your uh, skill set, you also have to see that, uh, you know, it's not about just getting a particular application or uh, web web uh, you know web application being uh, you know downloaded in the chrome or uh, let us say firefox or uh, you know let us say internet explorer or anything right these are all basic things which you ought to sh make sure that we are creating uh, you know platform agnostic application but beyond that also making sure that our applications and web apis or be it uh, you know the web apps whatever we are actually developing it is also being um, you know able to run either on the linux machine or be it on the uh, windows machine or you know let us say uh, the, take an example of the cloud technologies how do we really ensure that such and such applications are uh, you know in, in there is no dependency on the uh, cloud uh, technologies and the platforms wherever we are going to get hosted on right so this is something which uh, you will have to get to that kind of a mindset where you are actually utilizing your skills not only to the um, expense of looking at that yes you know the um, applications development as such uh, the development scenarios the different uh, frameworks what you have um, at your uh, you know uh, expense and also the architectural patterns whatever we have and the obviously the full stack understanding uh, the, from the front end to the back end how do we really achieve that not only that but then beyond that how do we really make sure that our platforms or applications or uh, you know uh, apis whatever we are developing it is actually able to function um, and uh, you know give us that edge of being deployed in multiple um, you know uh, platforms right next comes you know when you see that uh, the expectation on the higher end you know if you see that you know around 8 years of experience people all, are also contributing to the microservices and dockers or they, we have seen the people uh, typically you know contributing to these uh, technologies on the, you know with a higher experience as well so and how the the sooner you develop this the mindset in terms of the overall engagement, overall performance of the applications, the better your salaries are, the better your outlook is, the better engagement you can create and people will start believing in you that you are just not a, a programmer or a, you know a full stack developer or a dot net um, person um, you know who is actually bringing you know some skill and uh, you know to that table but beyond that you are also making sure that the business mind and uh, you know the mindset of developing to the uh, need of the market uh, understanding the business scenarios so every individual as a you know the you know each, each company expects that um, you know you also look at these additional skills and the more holistic you become in terms of the, your domain understanding um, your functional understanding and uh, the development as such uh, you know whatever you bring to the table you know that mindset is something which is um, every company looks forward to and that is how you grow faster in the companies, uh, given that edge of the skill, uh, what you can actually showcase in the market, right? So, and uh, believe me, this is uh, something which I had done in my own um, career journey. When I started off, as I started with it as a .NET, uh, in fact, ASP, um, and then I learned .NET. Then I became the .NET, Microsoft .NET expert. Uh, after that, I did the Microsoft SQL Server and then uh, .NET certification uh, on the architect front. So it, um, you know, even even if I have not contributed to the architect uh, roles directly, but I had been able to contribute to the, um, you know, architectural designs, uh, whatever we used to put forward in terms of the proposals 
right? Uh, project proposals which used to go out from the table uh, for the different engagements, the client engagements, I used to be part and parcel of the uh, the core soil sales team to become you know part of that uh, you know do documentation efforts which actually happen either from a technical standpoint or from an architectural standpoint. So this has actually always put me in the next uh, role and engagement because people believed in me that I'm not just a developer, I'm actually able to contribute in the actual you know, sales and development and the demos which we actually used to participate. They used to make sure that I've also been participating in the project demos and uh, you know the overall engagement because I knew how to handle the queries of the people and you know the customers or the clients. And I used to prepare myself for certain such queries in terms of the technology or the uh, you know activities, whatever is happening, whether we are in the design phase or development phase or in the testing phase, I can answer their queries uh, to the point while you know I'm able to address. So you need not be the uh, project lead or uh, the project manager to you know be part and parcel of uh, such and such activities this will also give you a very good mindset and that's how i have grown believe me uh, i had two maternities uh, you know my first kid i had in uh, 2006 actually and uh, just that, that those days i was working in 2000 2006 i was working in uh, uh, tcs and uh, just after the maternity, I came back and I joined back TCS three months maternity leave. Those days we never we were not given six months of maternity leaves. They, it was only three months of maternity which was given. And uh, by December I joined back and January I was promoted actually. So uh, and similar thing it happened. I had my second kid in 2009 and 2009 after a longer break, I took actually I had to take again three months of maternity, but then I had to take a nine months break because now at that time my hands were full and I had already had a you know less than three year old kid at hand and uh, my you know other kid um, you know was just at a very nascent stage. So I had to give my time to the family after nine months of coming, um, you know, that break, when I came back and joined in the month of June, believe me, July, I was again prom promoted to senior project manager. So why this this can happen only when you know that, yes, you probably take a, took a break for yourself for whatever reason. It could be a family, it could be your kids, it could be your parents, it could be anything. But the could, that break, whatever you have taken for a reason, you could also develop yourself during that break and uh, possibly look at some other uh, technical elements which you can actually improve upon your own skills. Uh, do another round of domain certification or uh, architect certification, anything which, you know, you can do something during your free time and then contribute to your own growth. And this is what I had, uh, you know, done and that goodwill also. I think for I have was always competent in my roles and uh, even just, uh, you know, until the last day uh, before I went on the maternity leave, I was very, very committed to my role and the engagement, whatever I was bringing in each of these uh, technologies. And, uh, you know, even that also played an important role because, uh, for uh, getting those promotions just, at my, just after my maternity breaks. And I'm proud of that. Not every company looks at, uh, you know, that way, but I've been fortunate players in that perspective that, you know, the companies looked at my potential and what I'm actually I bringing in. And they also looked at what I can do for the company going forward. And even though I was at a break, I still have that edge to get, uh, you know, the ownership and the authority to perform to the next level. And that's how I got promoted in these respective roles just after my maternity. So what I'm trying to encourage here is you don't have to really think that, yes, just because you took a maternity break, you, um, you know, uh, people will actually uh, put you into the diversity programs or, you know, you will be looked at. No, I don't think so. You can, you can still differentiate yourself by um, being a good presenter in terms of your skills, learn something new, making sure that you know your um, you know effort as such is seen in terms of any of these technologies whatever we are working on so i've tried to give an indicative experience um, you know in each of these areas how you could actually evolve as an individual as a professional 
and how each of these technologies will also look at you, um, you know, not just as being a contributor to that technology, but as a building, bringing in a holistic experience for the, um, you know, activities wherever you have been participating in. Okay. So this is um, what I would like to say. And um, I'm sure you would also uh, look at the, you know, DevOps angle. So how many of you are contributing to the DevOps and, uh, you know, the? I'm sure most of you are already doing that. But I would like to quickly touch upon that, uh, you know, when you look at the DevOps angle, development and operations, the, the seamless link which has brought in is to make sure that the development and operations, uh, you know, can seamlessly go in. Even now, if you see many of the companies, um, you know, the administration team, system administration team, uh, and the development team, when they are actually building a particular code, and, um, you know, not necessarily on the GitHub or the practices, what are actually we are, um, you know, considering on the DevOps front, I'm talking something different here. When you talk about two different teams working on different uh, scenarios of the development or operations or administration, right? How do we make sure that? we are um, inclining towards what a system administration team would actually face when my development application goes online, right? So this, this is also another uh, way to look at it in terms of your development act activities and the scenarios, the use case scenarios, uh, which you can actually build also, uh, you should take inputs from such teams uh, cross-functional teams who can actually help you evolve these applications. So that kind of engagement is also very important, not only looking at a uh, perspective of continuous integration or continuous deployment, continuous testing on continuous monitoring, uh, but also looking at the angle in terms of the use, building the use case scenarios. As a development team, uh, if you are actually looking at building some monitoring application, for my administration functions to happen uh, the right way, what are the kind of monitoring engagement which you know typically are look and looked at? What are the kind of challenges they are seeing? What are the kind of uh, you know um, time to time and frequency of these kind of tests and the scenarios which they actually deploy as an administration team? I think when when you develop a particular monitoring application per se, you could also brainstorm in this perspective. I think this is where the business analysts also play a role, but not limiting our uh, you know um, uh, our talk to business analysts. We can also play an important role in understanding why a certain function, it can actually impact the other cross-functional functional teams in making their jobs easier. So one example I gave you that, uh, you know, continuous, like, let us say monitoring applications, if you are developing, how do you really bring in that perspective and how do we really make sure that the this kind of an, uh, perspective is brought in when you're just, even when you're actually developing the applications at your end. Right. And uh, the CI CD pipeline also, if you see, uh, we are looking at the change management techniques. Um, I think agile is all about change management. You're actually looking at certain certain set of uh, features which actually gets de developed. And then uh, you also see that each of these, uh, you know, the integration, whichever we can bring in against each of these uh, agile, uh, you know, iterations, whichever you are quite trying to build, how are we really integrating them? What is the kind of impact it is going to create? How, how is it going to get tested once it, it is live? And how is the deployment, uh, you know, happening? So I'm sure most of you could, could be doing, uh, you know, these things, but then, how do you really look at the outlook of, you know, looking at each of these features and how is the kind of, what is the kind of impact which is going to brought in, uh, you know, by each of these agile iterations uh, we are trying to bring, right? So this is one um, quick thing which I wanted to touch upon. And uh, even if you see the client server engagements or the, you know, APIs which we build in, um, you know, to facilitate that, uh, you know, the client server kind of responses and the next level APIs which gets built in. So integrated architecture, as you see that it has evolved, not only to the connected apps, 
the cloud APIs, which we were discussing in the previous uh, slide, uh, like Azure has come, its, uh, you know, come by by its own APIs and structures for the cloud-based solutions itself. The custom APIs, what we actually also look at, ease of development has also evolved so much that you know those kind of APIs also have come in existence. The different libraries, there are so many open source libraries which we also use these days. Uh, to you know facilitate that there are some common functionalities as to security or be it the configuration aspects of the application or be it the you know the common libraries which we take in um, you know whether uh, um, as simple as the login functions or be it uh, um, you know the test functionalities or the test layers the and uh, the security elements or the configuration parameters, right? So how do we really make sure that each of these open source technologies, even though they are available at us, they also pose a, a risk of in, term, in terms of the um, you know, breach, which actually it can also create by utilization of these APIs, right? So how do we make sure that uh, whatever APIs which we are trying to integrate or managing you know, that uh, such and such APIs in bringing different uh, services together, in uh, bringing two different systems or multiple systems, or whether we are integrating with a legacy system or be it with, with a different, uh, you know, different set of systems. So the, here I'll give you an example of, uh, um, you know, uh, a company where we had actually worked in. It's an Hawaiian uh, uh, based out of Hawaii. We had actually executed an application, um, you know, development um, project for one of the you know um, hawaii based uh, col uh, college actually um, you know some you know, around uh, 6 years back and for them what we had done is uh, we looked at their legacy systems we studied their legacy systems we studied their data schemas uh, each of these data uh, elements the for each of these so we did some reverse engineering in understanding those legacy applications understanding those uh, data schemas it actually is exposing to us and whatever the apis we are trying to uh, you know nudge or build upon how is this data schemas going to get compatible with the data schemas on the other side of the applications. So they had multiple legacy systems. The problem is it's not about only one legacy system they had. They already they had multiple legacy systems. The core users spread across um, you know, the different uh, colleges or the schools which they had been operating in each of these uh, uh, different locations um, against that, you know, the you know that platforms they had uh, uh, you know the uh, challenge that each of these legacy systems were still being utilized and it was difficult for them to move out of these legacy systems so we had to make sure that we could not completely do away with the legacy systems we had to understand that legacy systems have to be core uh, you know the part of these entire ecosystem what we are what we were actually building for this particular uh, company and uh, the complete ERP uh, system which we were building, ERP system, enterprise resource planning, complete ERP system which we were trying to build for this comp company, we were also taking into the account on the legacy systems and making sure that the data schemas or uh, you know the code aspects are also being uh, compatible, data transfers and between the leg legacy systems also we had to look at certain orchestration principles and bring in the best practices, making sure that the data connectivity is established between the legacy systems and the ERP solution which we were building, uh, you know, from uh, for these uh, this particular company, right? So this is one scenario which I was trying to explain that um, you know how. Um, you know, complete, um, you know, companies cannot completely do away with their legacy systems. They would expect us to build connected apps and, uh, you know, wherever they, we have to bring in the cloud aspect, we also have to make sure that the legacy part cannot be done away. And, uh, you know, these custom APIs, whatever we have to build, uh, we will also have to look at it. And, um, you know, I think now with the technology which has evolved so much and the open source, uh, you know, APIs and uh, libraries which are available to us, it has uh, helped us to ease uh, our development efforts. 
but at the same time we need to be conscious of our efforts in terms of the integration architecture which we are building in and how heavy it is going to create the overall engagement how much of you know um, how heavy it is going to create for the company to really operate um, bringing in the entire system um, you know system of applications together yet talk to each other in the stipulated times and follow the slas right so slas uh, the service level agreements between the applications, between the different, uh, you know, core functions or the um, architectural elements, whatever we are talking about, we need to make sure that they are also adhering to the SLAs, the service level agreements in terms of their connectivity, data porting, uh, data management, data processing, and, uh, you know, visuals, final visuals, how, what is actually brought into the um, you know, web API or, uh, you know, the APIs or the web applications or any of the solutions which we are building in terms of the ERP or, uh, you know, let us say CRM applications, whatever you are building, right, uh, that way. Now, we talked about uh, client-server architecture. We were also talking about the ETLs, right, the extreme, uh, you know, extract the transform logic um, you know, those kind of batch processing techniques, which also have to be learned through. Not, I'm not saying that you have to learn a, each one of these, but at one point of the other, you will come across these, um, you know, these uh, particular technologies. You don't have to necessarily contribute to these technologies all the time, but you should be aware and be conscious about how data transfer is being happening what kind of impact it is going to create, how is my enterprise application is going to get developed, and what is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, structure actually it brings in for my enterprise applications, whether it is uh, for the uh, infrastructure forecasting, budgeting, uh, management of internal resources and infrastructure, or be it for the CRM engagements or the client engagements, client services. So there could be any scenarios of applications which you are building um, and any sort of applications which you are trying to connect across platforms or, uh, you know, so uh, legacy systems can be on a Linux, which is talking to be talking to our application on Windows, but the underlying schemas, you have to ensure that the data schemas are, uh, you know, compatible with each other. The data porting is happening. And, uh, you know, whether we are going by the ETL, uh, you know, transformation or be it with the APIs, uh, you know, how are we really bringing in that real time and the SLEs into play, right? And legacy system integrations is something which we will have to think through because, uh, um, you know, most of the organizations, uh, they are looking at the new outlook of, um, you know, building new applications and new age scenarios. Uh, using the different technologies uh, which are evolving again in their own spaces, but they can uh, they also look at the uh, you know modernization of each of these legacy systems and making sure that the legacy data legacy system as such is intact. But how are we really uh, bringing an a top view layer? for that legacy system to be viewed in the perspective, it needs to be viewed by the respective stakeholders of the company, right? Whether it is an internal employees who are using the applications or whether it is the uh, clients who are using the applications or whether it is the vendors who are using the different applications. We will all, we also have to look at how do we really create a, you know, the viewpoint for each of these legacy systems to really uh, look at from a modernization angle, right? Obviously, the class like cross-platform development is something. Which is, so what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, the, whether the underlying technology can be anything, but when you are actually seeing in each of these scenarios and the different practices which has been taken care in each of these areas or functions, you'll have to make sure that how is the other person taking into account and what is the impact my application development or my, the role, whatever I'm playing in terms of developing the features or functionalities or the application as a whole, how is actually, how is it going to create an impact against these different systems which we are trying to bring in together, right? And uh, gaming apps, I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, C Sharp or, you know, let us say, uh, these, these have also been, um, you know, contributing factors. So what is, 
that you can actually see that uh, you know and for the gaming apps also to develop what is that uh, you know the kind of technologies you can bring in and uh, the data which we have from the clients our our uh, respective data gamifying the solutions also is becoming a very um, you know um, new uh, thing right now most of the applications right now see, you see in the market we are already seeing how do we really it's not about you know just gaming applications how do we really gamify the um, applications whatever we are developing so for this for the better client engagement or better stakeholder engagement or be it uh, you know the coaching applications which you have seen already they are using a gamifying uh, this thing training services uh, companies um, they are also using the gamifying approach in terms of uh, building the application so we will also have to see how do we really evolve our outlook in terms of catering to any of these needs, how the industry is evolving as such in each of these areas, right? So what I'm trying to say is, yourself as a programmer or next level, come in with a domain expertise, you know, understand the domain functionality. Um, as simple as, let us say, you're working in a healthcare industry. In a healthcare industry, you probably are required to understand the verification and validation practices, right? To make sure that your application, what you are building is also impactful and you're also considering the scenarios of the different verification, uh, you know, validation practices. This is where as a product owner, let us say you are also performing a role of a product owner or, you know, pro product manager. We also look at those different angles in terms of how the domain uh, expertise actually is brought in in development of these applications, right? So next, also looking at the business angle in terms of how is it going to create an impact in certain such feature is not being developed and how is it going to create an impact by not being able to service in a certain scenario, use cases which we have not been able to develop in by certain such time. Uh, what is the impact it is going to create? Next, I think we are already operating on a data, the Facebook or, um, you know, let us say, if you open up your Google, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in Google, right, you will see that most of the, um, you know, news articles or be it the, um, you know, the uh, different snippets, what you see in the Google window, um, it is actually showing what you have searched past, whatever you have searched in the previous past, what kind of, um, you know, links you have actually gone through, what kind of, you know, reads you have done, uh, what is your interest areas, all these things have actually become very crucial. And that's how the Google has already started. You know, you, you probably observed that the Google is already operating on that front. Netflix, let us say, if you probably observed, if you go to Netflix, um, you know, they open up your Netflix account and you see, uh, you know, your whatever your past uh, movies which you have observed, the kind of, you know, the uh, series, whatever you have seen, I think it will also give you uh, the sense of, you know, what other likings you might be having and portray that kind of, uh, you know, data in upfront, in, in front of you that you could probably see the, um, you know, relevant uh, movies or the different other, other set of, uh, um, you know, uh, serials, right? So this is how the data has also evolved. And again, on the data front, there are two different roles what we have seen, uh, you know, evolving as such on the analyst. As a data analyst, you also analyze how the customer behavior is, what the customer behavioral, um, you know, demographics has been, uh, what kind of, and um, you know, the interest they have um, in part of which part of locations they have been seeing. So there is a lot of data which gets can be analyzed uh, on this front. And, um, you know, the data uh, analysts play a very crucial role in terms of portraying, putting together this inf information, processing it so that our applications which gets developed are actually to the next level. Improvement on the, uh, you know, the data front is also seen and how the data is being utilized to develop these applications and the different scenarios or the functional aspects also come out. Now, when you see the data scientist, right, data scientist is the next level role what you, they are not, um, there are, there is an over, overlapping, uh, some 
set of certain set of job responsibilities between the data analyst and the data scientist but data scientist also looks at some statistical scenarios uh, some statistical techniques they uh, use actually to study the data uh, some algorithms which they can actually play it against and study the data on a holistic way the big data aspect and against that they actually inter, uh, you know extrapolate the information and um, present it to the either the data analysts or the business analysts or the you know the uh, overall engagement whatever the applications are built against right so this is where you will probably have to have a mathematical acumen where you are probably going to uh, differentiate uh, differentiate yourself so these are all different um, you know the uh, expertise levels what we are also seeing that how each of these uh, um, you know let us say the even the full full stack developers are also moving into the data aspects of engagement what they can actually based on their observations based on their uh, previous past experience um, whatever they have had in their careers when you connect the dots you could also see how each of these let us say um, you know the healthcare industry you have a different set of patients and different set of data uh, this thing how many each in a particular one particular uh, let us say apollo clinic apollo clinic has operational been operational in 20 different locations in bangalore and uh, let us in each of these locations what kind of patients come in what what kind of patients come in for diagnosis more than um, you know the actual uh, you know the treatments what kind of treatments are happening in understanding what kind of um, you know engagement we are able to see in each of these uh, you know clinics and all that it makes a lot of difference in terms of how a sales team or the marketing team or a crm platform and a, or a erp platform enterprise resourcing plat uh, you know erp platforms which are utilized within apollos right or be it the uh, crm platforms for uh, utilize being utilized for client engagement how do we, how do we really see each of these scenarios in making sure that our clients are engaged better uh, clients are being addressed for their uh, you know uh, issues uh, let us say as simple as diagnosis diagnosis has happened and you ought to receive the report in three days but it is not received and fourth or fifth day the surgery is due for that patient and he is not received so these kind of scenario i'm just hypo hypothetically i'm trying to play a scenario here but this actually puts a, puts the clinic or that particular uh, you know hospital in a very bad spot right so constantly um, these applications have to be on the dot, follow the SLAs, make sure that they are catering to the need of the hour. Now, earlier, uh, you know, there, there were a handful of hospitals and handful of, uh, you know, like, you know, people going to the hospital. The population has evolved so much now that, you know, we, there is a waiting period for every patient uh, to come for either for a diagnosis or for this so there is a there is there are some applications which are built in the healthcare domain itself to improve that data role right how many patients can be um, you know exercised in a particular um, stipulated time if you ought to if you clearly know that okay in this particular time frame i can serve these many patients these many blood tests can happen these many ultrasounds can happen these many um, you know uh, so these many um, you know the customer uh, you know the clients can come in walk in for their first level interaction with the uh, you know the physicians so all these things matter a lot for the uh, healthcare um, you know uh, industry as well to make sure that that um, engagement which is seen in the applications what we are developing on the ERP front or the CRM front or be it internal operations point of view we are very very um, pl playing a very important role in terms of bringing that SLS together right this, uh, the service levels get to the next level and the engagement also improves sir. and this is where you would see that the hospitals have uh, not been able to up to the mark and they go down in their quality and service though they were doing pretty well in certain such time uh, you know when they were operating at the previous stages of their uh, you know um, uh, experience or whatever they were bringing to the clients 
So the, the industry is also evolving. Similarly, if you look at, um, you know, the financial domain, um, you know, le let us say financial domain also, there is quite a verification and validation practices which actually become core to our, uh, you know, financial exercises. So one example I'll give you, one of the, um, you know, uh, you know, my uh, own uh, the, um, family uh, relations, what I've, I've, we have seen, um, you know, what happened around 10 o'clock, around 1 lakh of rupees was deducted from his account. This was a known bank and it was, uh, you know, uh, you know, deducted. And the son and the father, they realized that, okay, oh my God, 1 lakh, why was it deducted? They had no clue of why the 1 lakh was deducted. And this is, believe me, this was a very good bank actually. But why it happened, no one was clueless. And after two hours, they have observed that by 12 o'clock, again, it was deposited back, back into his bank account. Now, why did it, this happen? Pardon me. I just, uh, so what I was trying to say is, why did this happen for this, uh, uh, you know, organization why, or for this particular, uh, you know, the organization to see that one lakh or whatever, you know, it was deducted now for two hours. It was not there in his account to, you know, um, but why did it happen? I think we will have to really look at, uh, you know, these kind of things, studies have to be done. And if it is happening in the banking industry, um, you know, very frequently, then the bank has to really take in certain steps in making sure that this has come to my notice because I knew them. But then these things are happening, uh, although the money has not gone out of his bank account, it has come back. But imagine that trauma he would have gone through that two hours and for you know unfortunately if he needed that one lakh rupees to certain expense um in those two hours only he wouldn't have used right i mean he wouldn't have been able to do anything about it so this kind of things are happening even for the bigger players in the market and how do we really make sure that um, you know, such kind of issues do not happen uh, for this. So there are, uh, you know, be it healthcare domain or financial domain, you will have to make sure the sentiments of the people are also being um, you, know, ex uh, you know, expressed in each of these platforms, whichever we are developing. This is where the domain expertise plays a very, very important role. And the business angle also comes into play. Imagine the trauma which was created for this particular old man and I'm sure he would be started think he would start thinking that should I shift my uh, bank, you know, to some other bank or should I go to some another bank um, or should I stick to right? So at least he got that. I'm sure he would have got that thought. So uh, this is what I was trying to emphasize that don't just be a, you know a full stack developer or a programmer or just try to see the outlook and how do we really bring in the change for any system to operate in the way it's supposed to operate and how do we really make sure our efforts are seen from a business standpoint and many of the companies um, I'm, I'm sure you have probably would have come across um, companies are taking initiatives in um, helping the employees to think like an entrepreneur now why is that the company employees are being you know driven to think like an entrepreneur why is that Right. The, the need of the hour is that, you know, when you when you as an employee you also uh, understand the pain a particular uh, business goes through in case if something doesn't happen the way it's supposed to happen or a new development or advancement which is supposed to happen in the industry in that particular uh, domain or segment and that particular, um, you know, for that particular company, you know, the, the advancement, whatever is supposed to happen, the company can crash and also, uh, you know, completely go down. So the technological advancement, whatever it has to supposed to be bring in at the right time, what it matters to any company, right? So we also have to see those things, um, which actually becomes a very big, you know, a big thing for the industry, the way we are actually moving forward um, in the way we are operating in. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is, um, you know, I understand that the technologies angle uh, we are seeing 
and the traditional ways of uh, doing the you know businesses are happening the traditional way the digital transformation is happening the uh, in in different perspectives but we also have to see how is the impact it is creating what is the kind of uh, engagement it is going to bring and what is the change which is going to uh, bring in the industry wherever we are operating right so this is a slide which i wanted to put together uh, i mean this is um, the source is from mckinsey and I wanted to show you that under the different survey, which is done in different organization, how the digital transformations are happening, which what are the kind of technologies you should also look forward to where you can also um, engage yourself building that kind of a mindset and improving your uh, skill set in such and such areas not only to the core development uh, technological advancement as such in your own skill set but also looking at bringing at the big picture so we are seeing the traditional web technologies transformation are still happening right like i was giving you the example of uh, this um, hawaii based uh, college and school which they have transformed their legacy applications to perform better they have brought in an erp system which is sitting on top of these legacy systems and helping these uh, business functions to operate in an effective manner so that's the traditional web technologies you know which every company is evolving in its own space um, how each of these companies are operating. Now, coming to the cloud-based services, cloud-based services have also picked up, um, you know, very uh, high in the recent past, especially in the last 10 years we have seen. And many applications, the APIs have come into play uh, in terms of managing that efforts for Amazon APIs or for, for Amazon, uh, making sure that the cloud services uh, hosting, which is happening in Amazon for the different applications, whether it is microservices architecture, which you're playing against or MVC architecture, which you're playing against. How are you really utilizing these cloud-based services? So many companies have come forward to provide those cloud-based solutions and um, you know, um, helping each of these companies to evolve to that next level and placing themselves in each of these uh, you know cloud solutions. What we have, Amazon and Azure, I'm sure, my, you know, are the bigger players in the market. But there are many small companies also are providing their own cloud solutions for the small set of companies, the startups, and also for the uh, uh, you know mid-sized companies are also used, right? So. You should be aware of the compatibility, what we are looking at when we are actually developing these applications. Then mobile internet technologies with the advancement of smart um, you know, engagement, whatever is the, our mobile phones are bringing in these days, mobile internet technologies have evolved so much. And uh, you know this is where the gamified approach also is playing a very important role in terms of utilization of the different apps and um, you know easy access ease of um, you know access ease of doing operations ease of doing business ease of doing um, you know activities for the clients the different stakeholders or the vendors the different apps have been developed in those perspectives the mobile internet technologies have also evolved so as you can see um, you know we are seeing the traditional web technologies digital transformation is the highest at this point also and the cloud based solution, cloud based uh, solutions followed by the mobile internet technologies and the big data architectures whatever we are playing in right now it is also picking up because the data is crucial to any company like i was giving you the example of the healthcare industry how they should also see how the data being is utilized and portrayed and how they can actually evolve their day-to-day -day, uh, activities and functions, right? So the big data and analytics, um, how do we really see? Uh, so Power BI is also an excellent tool, which is actually playing a very important role in terms of analysis um, as such. And you know, you have the Power BI APIs also, which can be utilized in each of these development and applications. Um, how do we really look at you know, developing each of this. Now the technologies, so many things have evolved over the period of time uh, so much that, you know, uh, you know, you cannot keep up with every technology, right? I don't think anyone can keep up with the, every technology advancement and it will bog us down, especially when you're coming after a career break, 
it you it will bog you down of what do i learn what do i see how much do i learn how much do i really uh, look at and what is the kind of you know confidence and um, you know uh, uh, confidence i am bringing to my bosses or to the managers whoever i am working for right so these things will always revolve in our mind but then we'll also have to see how do we really add on to our additional skill set the th thought process in terms of building our um, competence in terms of the scalability availability reliability and dependability of applications whichever we are building the service levels or whatever against we are operating against how do we really make sure that the difference is being seen in each of the features and functions we are developing be it from a domain understanding or be it from a functional understanding i think this is very core to our um, you know um, our own advancement i would say so don't just limit yourself to the career or technology aspect but you also as a uh, woman or ent you, know, uh, you know enterprising uh, kind of thought if you have actually it will also help you to advance in your career faster see that's how i have grown in my own career in my own uh, journey as such when i have grown in my respective organization as a techie and uh, i have seen my advancement happening very quickly i was the youngest project manager in infosys and uh, I was telling you that soon after my maternity break, I had been promoted to the senior project manager um, just after two months. And why do I, you know, get that kind of an advantage? Because I could differentiate myself while coming after the maternity and dif yet differentiate among, you know, other all other uh, project managers and, uh, you know, who have been performing in the same space, not just managing the effort in terms of the development, but seeing the business angle, making sure that we are committed to the need of the business and bringing our um, capabilities against that, right? Now, I'll not touch upon the other areas, but you can see Internet of Things is also picking up, design thinking aspects is also catching up in a similar way. AI and ML is it is still evolving, but I would say that many of the companies have taken steps forward in utilizing the AI and ML space. The and the companies who have already put their foot uh, into the AI and ML technologies early on years, they have actually done very well in their respective organizations in terms of catering to their uh, different engagements for the stakeholders or vendors or clients, right? And robotics. Um, or advanced uh, neuro-linguistic programming techniques has also played a very, very important role in making sure that the way AI and ML is as simple as, let us say, uh, if you see the Nokri platforms, or be it uh, any of these new age uh, um, hiring platforms which are coming up, right, they are using the NLP practices behavioral practices study of behavioral practices in terms of how the people actually want to get hired want to get uh, want to see how they want to advance in their respective careers that kind of a data has been very very crucial for each of these hiring um, you know solutions what we see in the markets to really utilize the nlp practices and bring change in the ai and ml uh, you know platform whatever you know they are using the uh, techniques uh, for developing such and such applications and that's where you see that each of these nokri or let us say found you know founded the monster everyone is competing in that space even with the startups which are evolving in this um, you know area with these new age techniques whichever uh, we are seeing so it is earlier nlp practitioner used to come in and do hr programs you know hr engagements i think uh, at a you know uh, scale where employee mindset was being developed right now the same employee mindset as a data is being utilized and being helpful in terms of developing such applications so can you see the shift what we are actually seeing in terms of the technologies, how we actually they are evolving and each of these technology uh, is being utilized. So I can see that, yes, whether you are actually performing at a uh, scale as a basic .NET developer or let us say with the uh, you know design patterns or the architectural patterns or be it the MVC architectures, whichever you are understanding, the .NET next dot, .NET core level where you are able to function in your organizations or be it let us say next level engagement you are able to bring in utilizing the different technologies, the cloud-based solutions or be it the um, you know the different um, you know the MVC core uh, what has been what has come in or to the next level where we are seeing the platform 
agnostic functions or functionalities, applications which we are building against the legacy apps. So I've tried to show you the journey, right, of the .NET also in the first slide. So you can see your, where do you stand in that journey and how each of these uh, different elements in terms of the transformations every company is seeing and how do you really picture yourself in each of those dots and how can you evolve as a skill and you know developing your thought process whether it is a cloud-based technology aspect or an AI point of view or NLP point of view as simple as design thinking point of view or you know um, improving your skills in terms of data analytics or data usage patterns um, and developing our applications in those sense right so this is the slide which i wanted to portray that so that you know the picture that so that you can picture how each of these companies are evolving and the ai or ml robotics or be it in the nlp practices whichever the companies are using they are still at a very nascent stage not all the um, you know the, um, you know big corporates are able to utilize these kind of skill set yet so this is a shift which we also have to see that you know um, the dotnet the way it has evolved is uh, Microsoft .NET is not just about the code or functionality or developing an uh, application or um, at an enterprise level or at um, you know at a you know for bringing in the personalization aspect for the stakeholders or for the users or the end users or um, you know internal uh, inter internal uh, internal application users so there is a personalization aspect also which is thought through right um, in terms of how a finance team perceives my data, which is available my, in my application. How a marketing team perceives my data, which is available in my application. How a sales team perceives my data uh, in terms of whatever application is there for the internal operations to succeed for a particular organization, right? So that's a personalization level, which you can engage at a department level. Now, when you see at a user level, there are many, I will give you a... Uh, one example of uh, one of the company, they are personalizing uh, the services and the products to the user level, actually, how the, we can actually bring in personalization at the end user level. So, and accordingly, the data which can be, which has been housed in these applications, all the data can be studied. And against that data, there is new process automations can be brought in. There is new data inferences which can be brought in. Against these data inferences, we can play new appli uh, application features and develop those application features features so that we are moving against the advanced look uh, way of looking our analytical data which has been projected to us against each of these applications which has housed from so uh, long in the company and but now they are actually going to the next level of utilization of the data and bringing in the right so this is where the ml.net has also you know come into play i'm sure you have heard of these libraries what um, you know the ml.net uh, al also um, you know is there so you you or you must be seeing that I think you, if you search for AI, um, uh, sorry, ML.net, ML um, I'll, I'll probably put this, uh, I think, link. Let me just say I've noted down for you. So, so you can actually look, explore on the ML.net libraries, um, you know, uh, what uh, we have. Then, uh, you know, the Azure what services, can you uh, imagine the Azure has evolved to the next level where it is giving the bot services in terms of the chatbot functions or be it the uh, different uh, frameworks where the functions can be utilized on its own, right? Those Azure uh, bot services, uh, is this is where you can find and learn about that technology. Then you also look at the .NET IoT libraries. Um, this is also, I've tried to note it down for you, uh, where you can actually also look at the .NET IoT libraries. Um, so, you know, take a look at it whenever, you know, um, you have uh, um, time as such, um, how these each of these libraries are also evolving. And uh, maybe at an early stage, um, maybe you can utilize it or you are not able to utilize it or you maybe you don't have a skill yet, but at least it will give you an outlook in terms of how these different libraries have actually uh, come into existence 
and what is um, what are what are these actually different functionalities it is providing us as right um, other than that i think i'm sure you have the other com common functional libraries i'll not touch upon you probably know that you know the azure uh, azure apis or the web apis it also provides the there are cloud based apis which are very you know very structured for the cloud cloud based solutions and interactions integration which is supposed to be done with the cloud applications uh, so there are apis and uh, libraries which are available to us on those lines uh, but i have given you uh, three crucial things because the industry is moving towards that where the ml.net or azure apis have actually been um, you know uh, coming into play right yeah so i'll give you an example here just present you a story of a stitch fix here see stitch fix company um, has evolved uh, you know over the years but the basis of this company when it started off itself that you know it actually evolved on the ai and ml uh, and it has actually used the core data uh, in terms of how do we really bring in the user preferences uh, it's a personalized styling service company um, a styling company and it provides uh, kids um, you know um, and men and women clothing actually solutions and they are personalizing it to the next level and the personalization also uh, so when they launched this particular uh, company right from the first space itself um, you know they had been able to personalize this aspect and they are doing very well in the industry when uh, you see there is big big uh, you know players in the us have actually uh, lost a business in this uh, you know space while the stitch fix has been um, doing wonderful job in terms of their market capture what they have been able to bring in and also the uh, you know the engagement whatever they have been able to bring in for the different clients in terms of the personalized feeling which they have been able to get so data collection uh, not only data collection the collating the data processing the data applying the against the ai and ml uh, techniques and then presenting the data to the fashion stylists. So they are not limiting the uh, solution to just AI and ML for data collection and interpretation and uh, suggesting the users on how based on their choices the behavioral uh, need on, and you know the, their uh, you know demographics or be it their user preferences um, not only limiting to that they are also going back to their internal fashion stylists to validate what AI and machine is showing and then uh, bringing in against the next level personalization touch. Uh, so not limiting to the data in terms of the preferred clothing or the styles or the preferences which any individual as a woman or as a kid or as a men you personally have, they also are trying to bring in the value adds um, and making sure that the customer is presented uh, the Pinterest boards or the different views or be it the different styling aspects on how um, you know they, they can actually present uh, the different uh, let us say you're ordering a jacket or a you know a pullover you know how you know the, each of these can be styled to your need to kind of you know let us say um, you know woman likes uh, let us say some women like floral kind of patterns in their uh, you know the you know clothing right if they like some floral kind of patterns in their clothing how do we really make sure that that element is also being addressed in the kind of designs which are they which are presented to the user and uh, fashion stylist is also playing a role. AI and um, AI has already played a role in terms of bringing certain uh, such designs, which uh, which are based on the user preferences, the clothing styles which a particular user has. And then um, again, the styling, uh, you know, st stylist can also play a role here. So that way, they are actually able to build in a value added service for each of the units and they have grown so big and the cost of engagement has also come down because here uh, the overall engagement time and time to delivery has come down right you order something you actually also look at the delivery timelines and you know depending on the whatever the order you are making and making sure that you know that is being delivered to your doorstep so time to delivery um, you know, making sure that your likings are also being addressed without much of intervention or you going to the stores. Um, it is all being done online, right? So that actually, see, um, so what I was trying to say is particular 
um, you know, scenario of a customer, uh, their need, their preferences, their styles, their, um, you know, uh, the way they would like to, um, you know, uh, figure themselves out as an individual uh, based on their style preferences, all that is being accounted. And then, uh, you know, this company addresses with a spe specific set of designs. And finally, so this is all, um, this particular company, uh, when they started off, they started off with this kind of an engagement from the beginning. And the company, obviously, early on, they had actually utilized the AI and uh, data, big data and information and how they could actually bring in certain such application. So there is a business, business edge towards, um, you know, serving a customer, not only just serving the customer in terms of the need, whatever he has, but making sure that his preferences, so personalization aspect is also taken care. And second is making sure that he is aware of other set of designs which he could choose from and finally uh, make the order. So you can, can you see, imagine the confidence this, um, you know, the company is actually creating for and playing in the minds of the consumers, right? Um, so this is what, now coming to the home lane, right? And this is another example which I wanted to uh, show the uh, last example which I wanted to present. So home lane, if you see, right, home lane is also doing something similar here, and which is actually um, had uh, um, uh, consumer behavior or observe over the several months. Like obviously, people who have been coming, what kind of patterns they have been visualizing, what kind of you know um, uh, you know different uh, um, you know engagement, whatever they are having in terms of seeing the different patterns, whether it is bathrooms or you know the different uh, you know the uh, let us say the um, you know bedrooms or be it the dining area or be it the living spaces, how they are actually perceiving, how they are seeing the each of these uh, uh, you know they are actually trying to collate that consumer behavior and it may not convert directly immediately for that particular uh, you know uh, customer to come in and take the service of home lane but over over the period of time it becomes convincing for the consumer to come into home lane and see that okay wow this is the different options we have and while he's exploring the other alternatives uh, somewhere else he's also saying see i'm not trying to promote home lane here but i'm trying to what i'm trying to bring in the thought process in terms of how the consumer behavior is being studied or, and utilized to understand their preferences, their expectations, um, you know, and in conversion points, whatever they are probably might have in terms of their uh, likings, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, observations they have been uh, making and uh, browsing each of these uh, website and patterns and all that. All that actually takes into an account and accordingly, these guys are able to present some solutions to the customers and at the same time optimize their uh, you know uh, that connect and engagement which they are able to build for the customer right so this is um, now how ai can further play a role here i'm sure um, you know the home lane is also evolving and has evolved to some extent already and uh, and these are the different uh, you know angles what we can actually think of that you know uh, predicting the design preferences like what the stitch fix is doing uh, right, it is actually predicting the design preferences for the consumers in the for the in the clothing industry. Similarly, here AI can predict the design preferences of the consumer based on his likings and uh, the browsing patterns, whatever he has. Similarly, the AR and VR kind of angle, what we can actually also bring in. How is the application utilizing the existing data and creating that experience for them in terms of the VR and AR, right? And how do we really make sure that the data in terms of their preferences, their expectations, and the different points which they, the customer or consumer can get converted, how do we really make sure those um, elements are also brought into the interior design aspects? So how much of automation can we bring in in each of these uh, things? And at the same time, um, building. So uh, with that, I will end this session here um, You know, with a note that we have done a similar um, exercise business transformation for one of a small scale uh, company where um, you know it's an interior design company. And how many the interior design companies, small businesses actually um, create ERP systems for their own. But the reason why they came to us was 10, employ 10 customers I'm serving right now, 50 customers I want to serve, right? Now, by doing process changes or adding more people, I don't think you can actually deliver to that scale. 
how it can be delivered is to make sure that we are automating some of the practices in terms of the process whichever we are handling as simple as taking measurements at the site or be it uh, you know automating the cost estimations or be it this uh, you know material handling whatever we are seeing the preferences of the customer on the materials have been captured cost estimation have been done on the fly in the application and bringing it uh, to the consumers uh, uh, you know viewpoint on the screen and helping them to judge in terms of the cost which they want to operate against the different models which they want to go against and the different um, you know the elements as simple as you know a table or whatever you they are actually trying to lights or any other equipment whichever they are trying to purchase for their home uh, how are they really deciding on the cost factors so this whole thing gets simplified for this organization by developing an erp solution and can you imagine once this erp solution was developed this company has gone out of the way and um, now giving the same solution to many other interiors companies so it has become a new business of um, you know the revenue stream for this company to really look at so this is what i wanted to uh, quickly touch upon that you know it's not about development or something how do we really see the business uh, ang angle of development of any function or functionality feature and how that can actually transform in a particular engagement, not necessarily helping the internal employees, but to our external stakeholders also. So I think with that note, I have, I may end uh, my session here and uh, I always believe that you have to dream before you can be dreams can come true.